so downtown Orlando UX meetup. Um, so from all of us here, we really wish you uh, best wishes to you and your family through these trying times. Um, I know it's hard. Uh, it's hard for everyone. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that for the next an hour and a half, we could just focus on learning and growing and sharing with each other uh, and not to worry about all the crazy stuff that's going on. Uh, so really hope everyone there out there is doing well, uh, you and your family. Um, so today we have Jai uh, kind of talking about storytelling by design. Um, I know it's, a, it's, it's an interesting topic for me. Uh, it's definitely an awesome topic to talk about as designers as a whole, but also anyone who works in technology or beyond. Um, so this is exciting to have Jai kind of talk about this a little bit and we'll get into that shortly. Um, I should probably introduce myself. Um, I'm Abhishek Murali. Um, I'm a UX designer here at PartyMS. I'll be kind of taking you through this initial uh, few slides before I hand it over to Jay. And you've already met Jason, who's the UX team lead at Paylocity. Um, I definitely want to kind of plug in our rest of the downtown uh, Orlando UX team. Uh, so we have Leah, uh, Wes, and Matt. Um, it's awesome to have uh, these great folks kind of helping organize and bring the community together. And uh, we are just really happy to have you here with us today. Um, for some of you who may have been with us before uh, and are probably in the screenshot that you're seeing here, <laughs> I see Avery and Stacy. Um, so our mission is, of course, to create opportunities for anyone to learn, discuss, and share knowledge about the field of user experience design. Um, this is something that Matt has championed for, uh, for a long time and something that we hope to continue in the future. Um, and we're really proud to kind of be able to bring you this opportunity even during these times and really happy to have you here. Uh, a, big a big thanks to our sponsors. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get you pizza and beer for this meetup, uh, but we really appreciate everything Tech System has done for us and we do want to give them a shout out, um, even though we don't have pizza and beer now. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to kind of hand it over to Jay. Um, so I first met Jay um, um, during the uh, kind of virtually during the IAC conference last year. Uh, it was awesome to kind of keep in touch with him on LinkedIn, read the blogs he's been writing, and have the opportunity to have him come and speak with us today. Uh, so with that, uh, he's coming all the way from Austin, which is awesome. Um, and we really, really appreciate, uh, Jay, you kind of taking the time to share um, everything that you know with us. So with that... I'm going to transition over to you. Uh, feel free to kind of share your screen and take it from there. Um, although we can't do a round of applause, um, this is the point where probably I would ask everyone to kind of give Jay a round of applause and welcome him to the meetup. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. Um, this is actually going to be, I think, a lot of fun. It's one of those moments where, especially in the light of all of this, with all of us working remotely, is something very powerful about just a bunch of us getting together around a common topic and just having a conversation knowing that most of us can't really go outside of like the one block perimeter that's our house or you know depending on where you live potentially it's shorter than that let me share my note here we can get started Okay, cool. Well, thank you again. Um, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off with, I guess, first introduction. Uh, my name is Jai Dandekar and I work at PayPal. Um, I'm lead there and so I uh, oversee a team that works on customer support. I'm also, um, when we're short staffed, which is um, all the time, um, I'm also hands-on individual contributor helping out with the work. And so um, I'd say when it comes to what I do these days, as well as my previous job, storytelling has definitely been something that's been near and dear to my heart. And I think when we look at the skill set of a designer, especially now that we're all remote, right, dispersed and trying to influence and be influenced from our respective homes and places, um, storytelling definitely plays a key role. I think it's, I'd say it's important to even start off with, we've been storytellers pretty much for as long as we can remember. I mean, if you look at cave paintings, the way stories are passed down from generation to generation through actual memory, um, hieroglyphs on, on the wall. Storytelling is almost in our DNA, uh, depending on what history book you read. Um, the manifestation of that story depends on um, 
the folks you're talking about, but all in all, there's a common thread about all of us communicating through narrative. And when I think about UX design, um, I'd say all narrative as a profession really is the journey of the design process. And it really is a journey, right? Starting off with ambiguity and trying to carve through a series of decisions over a period of time, um, the rationale backing those decisions, ultimately the deliverable that should ideally solve for a user's problem. And when I think about storytelling presentations, I think one of the things is when we think about presentations, we think about it very much in a very formalized way. So we think about it as you put together a PowerPoint or a keynote, you have a bunch of people that are gonna be on a call and then you're gonna present this idea and go through the whole story. But I think the venue for storytelling can be as informal or formal as, as you make it. So um, it could be as simple as a design review with a few of your friends. Uh, you still need storytelling to get that context. It can be the entire company attending a presentation, but everybody there still needs that context that you inherently have because you're the one working on it. And I fall victim to this, much like everybody else I'm sure on this call. When I miss that opportunity to do that kind of lead up and establish the context, I usually get like that expression. Um, depending on who I'm presenting to, I might get a variety of different expressions, but definitely one where confusion is not A, productive, nor B, if I do get feedback, it's not gonna be feedback that'll help me move forward. Because ultimately the goal of any of these reviews, no matter how big or small, is to get that feedback, see what I'm missing, and then keep moving forward, incorporating all of that feedback and making the proper edits. And so, Framing the work really is critical to ensure alignment. I'd say when it comes to each, right, quote unquote presentation, there's really three goals I'd say um, I've come to find I need to accommodate for in order to make sure that um, I'm framing the work correctly and getting everybody up to speed before diving straight into the work. The first really is established context. I mean, this is really the brass tacks of what it is we're gonna cover. Um, the who, what, where, why, when, and how. A critical one is encouraging empathy for the user. I've come to find that, uh, and I'll cover this later in the presentation, that ultimately you are the bridge between your audience and the user who you've been designing for, for however long you've been designing for that audience for. And so their ability to empathize with your user is the difference between kind of dismissing a bias or an opinion and actually coming on board with you and kind of seeing the world from your vantage point. And then upleveling engagement really is around showmanship more than anything else. I think when we think about showmanship, we might have some preconceived notions of what that means, um, but I'll definitely unpack that in further detail uh, later on this presentation. We'll definitely start off. So established context, um, the five W's and an H. So this is something that I experienced actually not too long ago. I was neck deep in some work. We had been on this project for literally weeks trying to unpack this, this problem. It was really an ecosystem wide problem. We were trying to connect all the dots. And when you're in that mode and you're kind of going from a 10,000 foot view of the problem to a 10 foot view of the problem, you're kind of used to the moment you want to bring someone in to the, to the conversation, you almost inherently bring them in where you last left off on what you were working on. But the problem with doing that is whoever you're bringing in, regardless of how closely they've been working with you, don't have that same sort of mind meld moment with you so they can't easily get to where you last left off. In all honesty, they need some sort of a lead in. And when we talk about kind of introducing the larger contextual landscape, you know, what is the problem space that you're unpacking? It doesn't always have to be a, a long drawn out narrative. It does have to be succinct enough to where someone can track from the moment they're first hearing about this to where you last left off. There should be a pretty clear line connecting the dots. I think as you kind of decide when you're uh, storytelling for people, obviously the story can be shorter for people who you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis who are already inculcated in all of that versus those who are hearing about it for the first time. And in all honesty, something that I 
do and it and sometimes for me it's 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 tedious to even go through this task in my head but before every presentation i always kind of sit myself down and i'm like what are what are the five w's and the h really the things that we we, we learned about in grade school right you know who who is the user who am i actually designing for because what i've come to find especially uh where i work now at paypal there are many instances where we all don't necessarily know who we're all designing for in the sense of somebody might be designing for small business, someone might be designing for consumer. And because those contexts are different, and that might be my first time actually getting up to speed on who that user is, I need that sort of context, that sort of introduction to help me understand exactly why they're designing what they're designing. The what, you know, what is the problem that you're actually trying to solve? And this is one of those situations where you can say, what is the problem from the user standpoint? as well as layering in what is the objective or the opportunity for trying to solve this problem in the first place. Where does this problem actually take place? Um, and it starts to really force you to unpack the user journey in a bit more detail because it's not as simple as just, well, it takes place in their email or it takes place within a tool they're using. You still need that larger context of where. How frequently the problem occurs. And I think there's been many situations and I'm thinking we, we're all kind of in the same boat here. There have been problems that I've had to solve for that someone experiences once a month or once a year because it has to do with their taxes or it has to do with some other thing. And then there's problems that can happen very, very frequently every day, once a day, twice a day. But the when is just another piece to that larger story. And then ultimately the why, which I think is a fun one because there's the why from the user standpoint. Why is this a problem for the user? Why do we want to solve it for them? What will their life be if we're actually able to resolve this for them and how will it make it better? But when we start to think about storytelling and storytelling specifically from a design point of having layers, it's not just going to be the storytelling that you would do for the user. There's also a symbiotic relationship that the business will have with solving that problem. Why is the business prioritize this? And it starts to let you have different sort of conversations with your stakeholders and partners. And ultimately the how, really how are you planning on solving it? Um, and then how you frame that also is very interesting because it could be early on in the process where it's your first hypothesis, it could be much later on and you've gone through your, your past attempts. But just as important, really managing expectations on kind of where you're at within that process and what you plan on presenting and ultimately what kind of feedback you're receiving. Because if you want to get the right feedback from that presentation, you don't want someone to mis uh, misinterpret a visual mock for a wireframe, right? You want to make sure that wherever you're at in the process, your peers, whoever's in that room, can give you what you need accordingly. I'm going to pause for a second. We want to stop, uh, James, for questions or Keep going. Um, I think we can keep going, uh, but I do want to maybe put this out for everyone. If you do have any questions as uh, Jay is talking, definitely feel free to put it in the chat so we can answer them or Jay can answer them as and when they come. Um, uh, but so far we don't have any questions, so definitely continue, Jay. Cool. User empathy is an interesting one. Um, and it's interesting because, and we were talking about this before everyone joined the call, as a UX kind of community, we're pretty diverse in terms of where we're located and what we do. But I think the flip side of that too is we, do, we design for a very, very diverse set of communities. And so because of that, there's going to be the situation where when you're presenting some work to somebody, chances are they're not familiar with the person from that audience segment. And I find it fascinating because when we look at the value of user experience and we look at how it's expanded across the decades, its applications are, are everywhere. And so when you start to unpack a problem and you get to know your user, you could very well be introduced to a, a variety of people who you might not right, right off the bat feel like you have a lot of shared interests with. But as you've taken the time to unpack that user's life, as you've gone through customer interviews, as you've done the research, you in time organically find those shared interests. And many often, you know, they'll be in environments that we've never experienced before, right? Because it's not a part of our day to day. 
So the journey that we take to create empathy with our users, create that sort of connection, become their advocate and their spokesperson for a better experience. The reason why we fight to give them that better solution um, is a result of this process. But the fact is, is that quite honestly, you might be in a situation a number of times that the people who are in the room haven't had the ability to go through that process and take the time that you have taken to develop that level of empathy. So in many ways, you're having to find the means by which you can shorten that time frame and become that bridge to generate that empathy that you already have for the user, but generate that same empathy from your audience. So I think one of the best entry points I've found has been trying to link kind of emotional reaction in this case, um, yuck, to <laughs> like a, a, a particular part of the interface that you're looking to solve. This is a very like microscopic view, but just by sheer virtue of linking the emotional reaction, whether it's the pain, whether it's the sickness, whatever it is, to the actual thing in question, you're trying to get away from this, well, I don't like the color of that button, we should do it differently, and more about, well, the user, as we've understood it, feels this way, it actually really hurts them because of these reasons. We start to infuse a layer of humanity into the experience that your audience probably didn't have before you sat them down and started presenting to them. Another thing is, and I fall victim to this like everybody else, when you're in the process of trying to unpack a, a complex flow or a series of flows that kind of integrate with each other, you're really laser focused in a moment in time. And because you probably spent weeks and weeks unpacking this problem, you're okay having this ability to be both in that laser focused kind of like ultra microscopic view, but still kind of able to back away at a moment's notice and kind of see the cruising altitude view of how everything comes together. And I'd say, this is one of those moments where you should be able to share both of those views with your audience, but first start from that cruising altitude view. What is that customer's day like, right? What are the things that go well? Where do they actually go wrong? What is that moment in question in context with the rest of the events preceding it? And then once things have gone awry, how were things gone off the rails as a result of it? Bringing your user to life through the details you already know is critical, but I'd say how you bring them to life and how you illustrate them is just as much. Now, I don't always personally use photography, even though I'm, I'm showing it here. Um, most folks who have worked with me in the past, whether it was at PayPal or at, at Visa um, or at Frog, I usually tend to draw stick figures with smiley faces and put little details on and articulate the user that way. But Something that brands the user and starts to pull your audience's attention in that well, I'm talking about this person or if you're juxtaposing illustrations with the solution and saying, well, this is how this person's reacting to the existing problem statement versus now look at their reaction as a result of the new solution. Something that I used to do at Visa um, that I haven't had to do so much at PayPal um, because of the type of storytelling I did at Visa was different was actually walk the audience through a day of the user and actually photograph the different places that that user has been. And more often than not, um, have like a hand inside the, the, the photograph holding a device, or maybe it's a photo from behind them while they're at a laptop or however they're engaging to kind of give that sort of context because that context makes it more real. I think the one thing that it's easy to do is if you're not able to tell the story correctly is dismiss the description of the user if you as someone in the audience have not felt like this user has become real to you. Empathy is a hard one and I can't honestly say that I've always gotten it right. But what I can say is when I have gotten it right, it's because bringing that user to life has required a lot of effort diving into the details. It's taken a lot of effort to really kind of unpack what makes that user tick. And especially in my time at PayPal where I have, you know, 
before the team, before I joined the team that I'm on now, worked on solutions for users who I don't have a lot of shared interests with in the, in the sense of my workday because I don't do the same things. And so the ability to kind of go in with a fine tooth comb and figure out where's the pain points, what are our customers saying, and then how do you kind of reframe that as the story? That I think is the critical piece. And I can't honestly say it's something that happens easily all the time. There are just some instances where it's really hard to craft that story. And you won't always get it right. But what I can say is that assuming you're working with partners who have a vested interest in making that user's life better, they'll have a vested interest in unpacking that story with you. And so I've been really fortunate, especially at PayPal, where folks from product, folks from engineering, across the board, when we get together to discuss the pain points, 10 times out of 10, they're trying to figure out, well, what's the best customer experience? And everybody kind of has a different take. So it's not relying on you alone to come up with that story. Up-leveling engagement is interesting because everybody does it differently. And I think especially in the midst of uh, COVID-19 and everybody being a video feed, you know, on your computer, and it's not so much just people are dialing in remotely. We have almost this instance where you're in someone's home, right? Because of how everything is turned out. There's a level of authenticity that we are able to operate with. And there's almost this permission to just be yourself. And there's this permission to not have to apologize for kids talking in the background or all of these things. I think in that same vein, you should take that as an opportunity to have the permission to whatever showmanship means to you and authentically how it relates to your personality, take that moment to use that to express it, as opposed to trying to emulate something else. I think showmanship pertains to every single detail that helps a presentation stand out. And I don't think it's limited to a witty joke, or a very eloquent way of describing something. I don't think it's limited to just a snazzy presentation. I think it's contextual. I think it's contextual to who you are as a person. I think it's contextual to how you choose to communicate with your peers, with your leadership, with your partners and stakeholders. And it's contextual to the type of work you're trying to describe. Because I can't imagine a one size fits all solution where the showmanship required for pitching an app like Instagram would potentially be the same sort of showmanship required to unpack an enterprise offering around, you know, people who crunch the numbers and put them into reports and communicate them upward to their leadership. I'd say the biggest thing more than anything else is just to be yourself. I will be the first to tell you that I, you know, <laughs> as much as I tried, can't help but just be myself. And sometimes that works in my favor. Sometimes I make jokes that, you know, I need to track back on because they're just not good jokes. They're not funny. But the fact is, is that as long as you're yourself, I think there's a, a level of appreciation for that kind of authenticity that goes a lot further than trying to be somebody else. A big one, and I would say, dare I say it, an easy one actually is going to kind of graphic design fundamentals to rethink how you're presenting the content. I'm aware that there are going to be templates, you know, preferred ways of presenting various things, but there's always an opportunity to, whether it's just a different take on the typography, whether it's a treatment of an image, whether it's finding hero moments in the presentation, whether it's the entire thing that you're redoing or it's just several slides, pick those moments you want them to stand out. You don't always have to have everything stand out. But if you're able to go back to things like type an image, uh, the typography basics, things that you kind of lose in presentation templates for the most part, it's a way to emphasize the details of the content and then up-level engagement on that particular thing.
So if you haven't noticed already, um, I'm a bit of an extrovert, just, just a bit. Um, and so if you have a flair for the dramatic, embrace it. But I would say I have a fair amount of peers who are not extroverts and the way they crack jokes on stage are not necessarily the same, but they get more laughs, right? Because of the way they deliver it. So I think if you have a flair for the dramatic, definitely embrace it. But if you don't embrace that too, you don't always have to have a, a dramatic entrance, exit, or in between. I think the biggest thing, and I'm gonna spend a bit more time on this, and I've actually gone through this presentation quite a bit faster than I actually thought I would. Um, the best narratives that I've helped construct have been the ones that have been shared by others. The ones that did not rely solely on me to build. Um, I think when you're talking about a future vision, especially for like a company, a direction you think that company should strategically go in, there's something to be said about multiple people who are not like you in the same field as you singing from the same songbook. They add different layers to it. They communicate it in a different way. It won't be exactly focusing on everything that you want to focus on because it's adding color to other aspects that you weren't going to because you're in different fields. I think one of the things that I've come to find, especially in my role as a team lead at PayPal, is that good storytelling also is about good relationships. You're trying to weave together a, a narrative for the user, you know, a North Star of where you want to go. And it's not so much just you carrying this torch by yourself. You need others to carry it with you. And they can't all be in design. They can't all be like you. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose. And in many ways, the more people you have singing from the same songbook, the better off you'll be, right? Because we're better doing this together. And I guarantee you that if you're able to craft that sort of well-layered story with other folks, it'll be a more informed story. It'll be a more detailed story. It'll be one that'll be a lot more holistic. And it'll be one that you don't feel like it's just on your back alone to carry. And I would say, especially nowadays in what I do, it's the storytelling that actually helps build the bridges. And it's, it's interesting because depending on what the story is you're telling, it could be as simple as a feature update to as something as complex as a complete company-wide shift or adoption of a new initiative. And I've seen both and experienced both. But the road to the latter is a longer one. It's a one that's more organic. It requires more trust. And your ability as a storyteller to recognize that sometimes you don't get all the chapters correct. I'll end with this quote because I think one of the things that, and I will, I will personally kind of put myself on for this, we sometimes think we're the only storytellers in the room, but I think we're all storytellers. We just have different stories to tell. And especially in design where we feel very close to the work, sometimes it's very hard for us to share that narrative. But I think if you allow your partners to storytell with you, you'll find that the influence is different. But more importantly, it's part of our DNA. That's just how we're made up. Thank you.